It's a saying as old as time itself. Never hire a hooker on Craigslist and never ever pay in advance. The internet is filled with stories of women and men posing as prostitutes who then rob their clients blind and make off with the money. But those stories are nothing compared to the tragedy of 26-year-old Jennifer Papin. Papin was a prostitute working in Long Island who advertised her services on Craigslist. On March 24, 2010, she was contacted by 23-year-old Chad Johnson. Papin thought nothing of it, just another night and another job. For $80, she agreed to meet Johnson in his car and take care of their arrangement, but things didn't go as planned. Sometime during the rendezvous, Johnson asked for his money back. Papin refused, at which point Johnson got violent. He got his hands around her neck, and before she could scream for help, he was pressing her windpipe shut. He choked her to death and then drove to a wooded area near the Long Island Expressway and buried her body in a shallow grave. The subsequent investigation into Papin's disappearance turned up Johnson as the person who'd last seen her alive. A background check revealed that Johnson was something of a serial choker who'd had brushes with the law in the past for assault, and he ended up leading the police to the grave he dug for Papin. In 2003, Brian Boucher was looking for a roommate to help share the rent, and John Williams was looking for a place to stay. It was a match no different from thousands of others that happened on Craigslist all the time, and for a while it looked like it would work out. That is, until Williams began acting strangely. To sweeten the deal, Boucher had offered his new roommate the only bedroom in the apartment, hoping that the added privacy would convince him to stay. It was just what Williams was looking for, because Williams had a secret. According to Boucher, Williams kept to himself a lot. Boucher could spend hours in the apartment thinking he was alone, only for Williams to suddenly walk out of his room with his head down, do whatever he had to do, and then disappear inside the dark bedroom again with only the soft click of the door's lock as a farewell. Boucher began to get worried. As the months passed, Williams began staying away from the apartment for extended periods of time, and during one of these absences, after they'd been living together ten months, Boucher had had enough. He broke into the locked bedroom intent on packing up Williams' things and sending him on his way. On the bed, he found a bulging manila envelope, and what he saw inside made his blood run cold. It was filled with torn up credit card offers that Boucher had received in the mail. Williams had been going through his trash and collecting pieces of it. Along with the shredded mail was a sheet of notebook paper with the name and addresses of Boucher's family members including creepy personal details, like the date his parents had been married. On another sheet of paper was Boucher's credit card information and the passwords to many of the websites he used. It was like a bizarre file on Boucher's private life. Then Boucher found a diary, and at the end of one of the entries he found a chilling sense. I'm only now just starting to get over being afraid every time someone looks at me twice in the street. Every time a cop looks at me, thinking they know. All it took was a quick Google search for Boucher to find his roommate on the front page of America's Most Wanted. Months earlier, Williams, real name Dino Lauren Smith, had pulled off a brazen jewel heist in San Francisco, making off with 10 million in diamonds. A call to the police revealed that Williams was already in custody. Boucher never found out why he'd been collecting his personal information but he does know that the situation could have ended much worse. Catherine Ann Olson had recently graduated from Minnesota St. Olaf College and was working part-time as a nanny until her career in theater kicked off. She was 24. Michael John Anderson liked to play paintball and wonder what it would feel like to kill a person. He was 19. Posing as a mother named Amy, Anderson posted a Craigslist ad in 2007 looking for a person to babysit a child the following day. Olson jumped at the opportunity and they made arrangements for her to show up at the house around 10 a.m. to start the job. According to some comments made by Olson to her roommate, she had a weird feeling about the job, but she decided to go through with it anyway. There was no way she could have seen what was coming. 
After arriving at the house, a rundown split level in Savage, Minnesota, Olson was greeted by Anderson, who led her up to his bedroom on the second floor. Nobody's sure exactly what happened next, but at some point Olson tried to run. Anderson shot her in the back of a 357 Magnum, dragged her body down the stairs, and stuffed her in the trunk of his car. He abandoned the car a few blocks away. Then, in an attempt to destroy the evidence, Anderson crushed Olson's cell phone and wrapped it up in a bloody towel before dropping it into a public trash can. He apparently didn't realize that the towel had his name written on it in black marker. In 2009, Anderson was sentenced to life in prison without parole. On a chilly morning on August 11, 2011, Murayama Alejandre waited for hours at the Mesa County, Colorado bus station where her roommate, Luis Olivo, was supposed to pick her up after a long ride in from Denver. When he never showed, she got worried and called the police. When deputies arrived at Oliva's home, they found a grisly scene. Oliva was lying naked on an air mattress in a pool of blood. He'd been clubbed multiple times on the back of the head with a blunt object. Nobody doubted it was murder, but finding the killer, well that was the problem. The investigation quickly revealed that Oliva had been running a male massage service on Craigslist. Suspicion then fell on Oliva's partner, Brandon Wathan, who lived with Oliva. Was it jealousy? A crime of passion? Not likely, since Wathan was working out of town on the night of Oliva's death. Besides, Wathan had helped Oliva set up the Craigslist sex operation months earlier when they'd both been unemployed. Investigators then turned to Craigslist records and email communications with the people whom Oliva had seen, and that's where they found their answers. All trails seemed to point to one man, an Army veteran named Billy Joe DeLacy, who had apparently been Oliva's last customer before his death. But even that trail soon began to feel like more of a maze. DeLacy first said he'd never gone over to Oliva's, then he admitted that he had, but he'd left before they'd done anything. He then said he was paying rent at the time of the murder, but all his checks were dated after the killing. Child pornography was found on his computer, but what did that prove, since he'd stolen it in the first place? He said he couldn't talk to police long because he was soon to be redeployed, but the Army hadn't talked to him since 2008. The bizarre trail led on and on, but finally in 2012, DeLacy was arrested in Pennsylvania and indicted for first-degree murder. Two girls needed a new suitcase and found a deal on Craigslist. One of the girls offered to meet the seller at a local business, but he kept asking to meet her at her home. He finally agreed to meet her at a shop, and when the girl arrived, she found him waiting. He asked her to take a drive with him, so she left and ran home. That night, the man came to her apartment door and tried to kick it down. She escaped from her apartment and ran down the street for help. Police arrested the man and identified him as a serial rapist. A guy found a great $200 iPhone on Craigslist. He enlisted his brother to come along for the sale to help him test the phone. The two men met two very intimidating men at a nearby restaurant. The brother tested the phone and it worked just fine. The seller then demanded $250. The buyer would only pay $200, so the seller relented, very angry. As the two pulled out of the parking lot, the brother noticed the two sellers following them, so the buyer decided to lose them, driving crazily and running a red light. Later that night, the buyer was programming the phone when he heard a car door slam. The two sellers came to the door and threatened to shoot the lock off. The buyer called a neighbor who worked for the police, just as a silent shot blasted through the door. The neighbor arrested the two sellers and the buyer was ecstatic. Two guys decided they needed a new couch and found a great deal on Craigslist. One of them went to a house to examine it. The owner asked him to go around back, where the buyer saw four men in black robes. One asked where his roommate was, so the buyer ran to his car and drove off. He'd never mentioned that he had a roommate before. On March 18, 2015, 
Michelle Wilkins was glowing with joy as she made the short trip across town to the house of Danelle Lane. She was 34 weeks pregnant with a little girl. The baby was healthy and she just found a cheap bundle of maternity clothes on Craigslist. Just what she needed to cover that ever-growing baby bump. All she had to do was pick them up. When she reached Lane's home, Lane led her inside, where the two women talked for about an hour. Then Wilkins followed Lane into the basement for the clothes, and the pleasant afternoon turned into a horror film. Without warning, Danelle Lane smashed a lava lamp over Wilkins' heads and shoved her onto a bed then used a shard of glass from the broken lamp to cut Wil Wilkins' neck. Her hands went to Wilkins' throat, but there was already too much blood to get a good grip, so she pressed a pillow over Wilkins' face. Losing consciousness and terrified both for her life and the life she carried inside her, Wilkins tried one final desperate plea for compassion. I love you, she gasped. Lane grabbed a kitchen knife and replied, if you love me, you'll let me do this. Then she cut Wilkins' unborn daughter from her womb and left the woman to bleed to death. Miraculously, Wilkins managed to retain consciousness long enough to dial 911, and she was rushed to surgery at the nearest hospital. And in the same hospital just down the hall, a woman in the maternity ward tearfully clutched a stillborn child to her breast and told nurses that she'd had a miscarriage. It was only later that the truth came out. Danelle Lane faces 48 years in prison for the charges.